we're going to come across a passage today that is so important. It's so critical. You'll be hard-pressed to find another verse in the New Testament that has left a mark like this one in regard to, and not in a good way, in regard to building walls. In regard to building that wall that Yeshua himself tore down uh, between the Jew and Gentile. I mean, this verse has left the mark. And so, unfortunately, there's no way that I could possibly spend enough time on this that you can feel the weight and the gravity, the impact of this verse on Christianity. I mean, it's huge. And so we are really going to be digging into this uh, one particular passage today. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Mashiach. But then, indeed... When you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. He's talking to the Galatians. He is taking them back to the time before they were in the faith. And he's reminding them when they they were in that time period, when they were there, they had uh, uh, patterns, behaviors, certain things that they were practicing and believing. They were grabbing onto inventions of man's minds. These are the things that they were starting to, they, they, they were clinging on to. This is how they lived their life. And so Paul takes them back to that place. And then we go on to verse nine. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, what does he say here? How is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements? So what he's saying, you weren't in the faith, but now you've come into the faith. But what are you doing? You're turning back to the weak and beggarly elements. Now, be very clear on this. Even when you go into the Greek on this, what you see is that they are turning to things that do not profit. Things that make no difference against the indulgences of the flesh. Things that have no power against the enemy that is coming to steal, kill, and destroy, that is coming to take them out. And we learn something else. They're not just harmless because he goes on and says, to which you desire again to be in bondage. That's frightening because these things that they're grabbing hold of, they're leading them off a cliff. And the question is, is, oh my, what are the Galatians getting themselves into? What is it that they're observing that is weak and beggarly? What is taking them off this cliff? Well, as we continue, we read, you observe days, months, seasons, and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I labored for you in vain. This is what it is. This is what they're observing. This is what they're falling into. These are the weak and beggarly elements. Observing days, months, seasons, and years. We know the primary thrust of this epistle absolutely. In fact, throughout the New Testament, you see this. There's no question. The most controversial issue of the day is circumcision. Believing Pharisees were going out telling Gentiles, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. Now, guess what we learn right here? Well, there is the subtext. There are other things. I mean, do we really think that these believing Pharisees, they rolled into town, they say, hey, you know what? You're not circumcised. You need to get circumcised. Have a nice day. We're we're leaving. No. They came in and they brought a lot more with them. Here's some evidence. This is the subtext. Now we're getting to see there's other things that they left, a remnant, a residue of teaching, and they were grabbing hold of it. But it leaves us to ask the question, what do they mean by observing days, months, seasons, and years? It sounds like days, we're talking about Shabbats and months, new moons, right? And seasons, feasts. I mean, this is how, and guess what? This is how this is traditionally understood. This is how Christians for millennia have looked at this, whether we're talking about modern day Christianity or whether we're talking about early Christianity. And to help you appreciate this, to help you feel the gravity of this situation, the gravity of Galatians 4.10, the impact that it has made on the church, let me just share with you a little bit of history. I want to take you to the letter of, uh, of Ignatius to the Magnesians. And this goes back to, they say, to the first century. And there's debate about that, that it's in the second century. There's debate about whether Ignatius even wrote the letter. None of that matters. We know one thing. This is early Christian thought. And here's the statement. Let us therefore no longer keep the Sabbath 
after, pay attention to the verbiage here, the Jewish manner, and rejoice in the days of idleness for uh, he that does not work, let him not eat. Okay, so you, you look at this, let us no longer keep the Shabbat. Where do you think they got this from? This letter to Ignatius, I will tell you, it is explicitly from Galatians 4.10. This is where they derived this understanding. This is why they are proclaiming this and not in the Jewish manner. See, because I want you to understand something. All these things, the Shabbats, the new moons, okay, the, the festivals, the Yom Kippur and Pesach, all of these things in Christian to this very day are Jewish. They're very unchristian. And this is the divide. Do you see this? And the way that we're looking at Galatians 4.10 powerful impact on the church. Let me take you to the council of Laodicea and show you how this reverberates throughout history. And this is in the fourth century. It is not lawful to receive portions sent from the feasts of the Jews. Isn't that interesting? Not from the feasts of the Jews or heretics or to feast together with them, lumping Jews and heretics together, the very Christian thing to do in the fourth century. But the key thing is, is you're not to receive any food from their feast, such as Passover. Passover. Let me continue. Let me show you the next one. And it says this, it is not lawful to receive unleavened bread. That comes from Passover. Unleavened bread from the Jews, nor to be partakers of their impiety. It comes directly from Galatians 4.10. The way the men interpreted this verse, this tiny little verse and the mark it has left on Christianity. I'll show you one more, Canon 29. Christians must not Judaize. They must not Judaize by resting on the Shabbat, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's day. And if they can, then resting then as Christians. Separate the Jew from the Gentile. The Jewish Sabbath, that is about Judaizing. That's what that is. And this is where they're coming from. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. Now, remember in Galatians 4.10, see, they're turning to the weak and beggarly elements, to things that are going to pull them into bondage. This is where the verbiage comes from. Galatians 4.10. Let me show you the Visigothic professions. You want to talk about nailing it. Look at this. We will not practice carnal circumcision, which we know is an issue, Celebrate the Passover, the Sabbath, or the other feast days connected with the Jewish religion. Galatians 4.10. I mean, how you look at this, this little tiny verse that is hidden in this little tiny epistle has such a profound impact on the way we look at the Bible, the way Christians understand the Bible, literally the way they practice the faith, the way they walk it out. This is amazing. And that's why I'm saying I couldn't possibly spend enough time on Galatians 4.10 today. Considering the havoc it has caused. Considering how people look at it and how they have traditionally looked at it over and over again. The question remains, what is Paul talking about? What is Paul really conveying to the Galatians? Is he telling them, oh, you should abandon the Shabbat. You should not observe the Passover. All these things, Yom Kippur is bondage. Is that the truth? Absolutely not. And I, I could actually say not exactly. If we attempt to walk away with Christendom's traditional takeaway from Galatians 4.10, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to have a problem right off the bat, a significant problem. Number one, it's not consistent with scripture. It's completely inconsistent. And you need to remember that literally the foundation for good biblical exegesis, nay, I say the cornerstone for good biblical exegesis is consistency. So when you're reading the word and you think it says this, let me tell you something. You should be able to go the totality of the word and support your interpretation, your understanding. It has to be consistent. We don't get to just start tearing out pages out of our Bible because we don't like something. Hey there, this is Mike at Corner Fringe Ministries. Thanks for watching our video. If you liked the video or it encouraged you, do us a favor. Hit the like button. Don't forget to hit the share. 
And if you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button. Now, if you want to watch the rest of this video, hit the button here. And if you want to watch the rest of this series, you can check it out here. And don't forget, you can download the Corner Fringe Ministries app today on any of your Play Stores. Thanks for joining us at Corner Fringe Ministries.